Uh, thanks, Marty. I want to thank Ruth uh, for putting this together. She does all the work. And I want to thank you for coming. Uh, <clears throat> it's always good to talk to real farmers. Last winter, if you were here, we spent a lot of time talking about water. And that's what it's all about is water. And if you look at what impact that we've had with with no-till in South Dakota and whatever, it's all about water and better utilizing the water. And we calculated a couple of years ago for the Board of Regents uh, who wanted to know what the hell we did. The Board, <coughs> board of Directors of, of Dakota Lakes got together and we met with the Board of Regents and we calculated uh, the difference in crop production in 1987 versus 2014. And this was in 2015. Uh, if we took the center, the south center, and the, and, and the north central crop reporting districts in South Dakota, ba basically that middle third of the state of South Dakota in the middle there, uh, we changed, the farmers changed their, we used the, the Woolsey price the night before, Woolsey South Dakota price. We, we changed the amount of grain that they sold by $1.6 billion. Those are big numbers unless you're in Washington. But that's big, that's big numbers in South Dakota. That's a big increase, and, you, and it's, it's the thing that I noticed from when we first started doing this in uh, uh, 1990 till now. Cities like Gettysburg that at one time, years ago in the 60s or whenever, when there's lots of babies, had two, two classes in every grade in, in the elementary school. And then they went to one class in every grade. And then all of a sudden, they're almost talking about closing the school. They're going back to two classes in every grade again. And I think that's a good news. And I think part of that is how we produce things. And I'm going to kind of follow up a little bit with what Cody is doing. And then I want to talk about just some real basics. Uh, a lot of talk about soil health and muff and fluff and whatever. But there are just some real basics to how you do, how you do no-till. And it's, and it's just real simple stuff. So we're going to talk about a little bit of that, and then you can go home and get ready for the blizzard. Uh, <clears throat> uh, that's the Dakota Lakes, right? You know, that's our, our main station. Then we have some soils to the north. And if you're not familiar, actually, that main station, the north, uh, those north two quarters right in here, those are what we call Millboro soils, which would be very similar to what you see around Kennebec in that area for you guys further east. Uh, they're a bit, <clears throat> just a little bit better than the pier soils and stuff you see out here in some places. And then the south side are some pretty good uh, lust soils. Our north unit has the old triple threat with uh, Promise, Opal, and Sansarks. So those are ones that you're familiar with. Uh, some of you guys here have none soils, which are really quite good soils, actually, and then quite a few form some, farm some pure, pure soils or something like that. I have a little trivia question for you. There's a soil called, all our soils are named after cities and whatever, localities, right? So the sand sark is a really shallow soil. It's about a foot and a half deep over fractured shale, and it's a foot and a half of that real clay stuff, the true vertisol, just really shallow. What's that named after? Well, the San Sark Sioux, right? San Sark Sioux tribe. There's a little city of San Sark there right across the river from Gettysburg, but where does that name come from? It's French. Anybody here speak French? Well, in French, sans means without. Arc means archery or bow and arrow. So when the fur, fur traders first came to that area across the river from Gettysburg, the tribe they ran into there was not using bows and arrows, they were still using lances. So that's where that name comes from. It's kind of interesting. I always like to joke with my Native American friends from that. I said that those guys were the conventional tillers of the Indian society, the last, the last Native Americans to adopt a new technology, right? We still have people doing conventional tillage here. You shouldn't be doing tillage here. Water's too precious to you. Did a meeting yesterday in Columbus, Nebraska, get 28 inches of rain a year. 
well, maybe they can grow crops without saving water there. And then they got irrigators. They got irrigators sitting on fields there where they get 28 inches of water a year in rainfall. What a bunch of pessimists. <laughs> right? Okay, <clears throat> this is what our native vegetation looks like. We're going to go to Australia. Ruth and I are going to go to Australia in about a month. And they have trees everywhere. And they have less rainfall than we have because the rainfall comes in the winter time when it's cool and it goes deep past because you're not using any water and it all just moves deep and then you've got trees. Okay, so that, the only place we see trees is where there's a major drainage way. So the first time I went to Australia, I showed this slide. Somebody in the audience went, I said, yes, ma'am. She said, where'd the trees go? I said, Paul Bunyan cut them down. <laughs> they had no idea who Paul Bunyan was. See, so you don't do that. That was a dumb thing to do. So <clears throat> Ruth and I went to France four years ago, and, and we did a, Kind of it, we were in England first, that was fun, and then we went to France and they, they got us a car that had GPS that would speak English. And we would do a meeting, I'd do a meeting from eight till noon and then we'd hop in the car and turn on the GPS and go to the next town and somebody would meet us for supper and show us around that town and we'd do another meeting the next day and whatever. It was kind of an interesting trip. But every town we went to, they had to show us their castle. So we went and looked at the castle, and you got the grain bins, and, you got, and they all kind of looked pretty impressive and took a lot of energy to build them and, and a lot of work and a lot of wealth and whatever. And you, you know, you go, and, and now you got the grain bins there. Where did, where did you produce the grain that went in the grain bins? They said, well, in the land right around the castle. So you look over the wall, and it was so degraded it wouldn't even grow bushes very well. And you'd point that out that maybe that was one of the reasons it's no longer a castle. And when we looked at their soils, this is what they look like. And this is what they look like. And they're still plowing them, and they're plowing them deeper, and they're plowing up and down the hills, and there's places they're plowing down the hills because they can't plow across the hills, and they can't plow up the hills, so they can't pull it, so they drive up and plow down. And so I, I started the discussion by saying my ancestors left Europe to come to the United States because they degraded the soil so badly that they had in Europe that they had to go someplace else and find soils that weren't degraded. And then I said they've done a good job of degrading the soils that they found in the U.S. Okay. This area is part of the Louisiana Purchase. The Louisiana Purchase happened because there were, the La Viandre brothers came from Winnipeg, Manitoba, they were fur traders, and they came across the Continental Divide in eastern North Dakota. If you didn't know there is one, there is one there, between the Red River drainage and the Missouri River drainage, right there between Valley City and, and Jamestown, there's a Continental Divide. It's about this high, okay? And, <clears throat> and they came across that Continental Divide, they came down the Missouri River, and they buried lead plates in different areas uh, of, of around here. We don't know how many they built, they buried, but one was buried just above Fort Pier. And you can see that one in, in uh, the, the Heritage Museum. And it claimed this area for France. That was 1743. So the white man had been here quite a while. Uh, you know, pretty, pretty, actually before the Revolutionary War, we had white guys running around out here claiming the area for France. You know, pretty optimistic guys there too. And, and the, our founding fathers, George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and those guys were way back in the early part of our nation, the late 70s and 1700s. A few years more increased sterility will drive the inhabitants of the Atlantic states westward for support. They were degrading the soils, and they knew that, and they were trying to figure out what to do about it. Whereas if they were taught how to improve the old instead of going on to, in pursuit of the new and productive soils, they would make these acres, which now scarcely yield them anything, turn out beneficial to themselves. George Washington. 
He and Thomas Jefferson had lots of conversation about how stupid it was that they continued to degrade the soils. That's 300, 200 whatever years ago. Uh, <clears throat> David Montgomery wrote a book, Dirt. If you haven't read it, it's kind of interesting reading. This photo here was taken in South Dakota in the 1930s, because we were doing that. When I went to Gettysburg in the 1970s to teach high school chemistry, not, not ag, <laughs> I was teaching chemistry, people don't understand that, <clears throat> you couldn't be assured that you would make it to Pier and back. If you left Gettysburg to go to Pier in the wintertime, uh, <clears throat> you wouldn't be assured you were going to get home if, if, if the wind started to blow because everybody was doing wheat and summer fallow in that country, okay? And so one time about four years ago, I met David Montgomery talking about his dirt book at a meeting. And I said, you know, in the, in the teacher's lounge, I mean, in the speaker's lounge that you have at these bigger conferences, I sat down with him and I said, you know, you really should come and revisit that area north of Pier again and see what's happened there because it's changed. And he subsequently wrote this book, Growing a Revolution, which has a chapter about some of the guys um, in that area. In fact, Mike Arnold is in that, in that book. They talk about his, his operation, okay? But anyway, Thomas Jefferson realized that they had to do something, so in 1803, he bought the Louisiana Purchase, and then he sent Lewis and Clark up the river Right here's where Dakota Lakes is, by the way, right in there. But they came through here, so we know what this land looked like before, before we got here and started screwing it up. But what they were looking for were beavers. It was the first thing. That's what the Lavi Andres were, were looking for, is beavers. And they took all the beavers out. Well, what were the beavers doing here? All these dams and all these little tributaries, all the way from the Black Hills, down, down river, through Missouri, whatever. So you take all the beavers out, then you send the settlers in, and the settlers start to do tillage, they cut down what few trees there are, and they start overgrazing. And we have flooding. Now what should the response be? Put the beavers back and quit doing that stuff you're doing, right? Yeah, no, we're, we're not that smart, so we're gonna put in Large main stem reservoirs, we're European males, right? That's what we do. We go put in large main stem reservoirs. We've got four in South Dakota. They're going to they're gonna give us 500,000 acres of irrigation over around Redfield because that was flat. In the 1930s and 40s, you can't irrigate land that's rolly. You have to have this stuff that you can run the water down between the rows. And we all know that you couldn't produce corn and soybeans at Redfield without irrigation, for God's sake. And it's kind of like Nebraska. They don't think they can produce anything without irrigation, Ray. Did you notice that? No, I didn't. <laughs> so they built a big dam, and they built a big power plant, and they built an irrigation pump station that's never been used. And they built a whole bunch of canals. So I, I show people the canals when they come to visit. If they're going the right direction, we show them this huge huge canals that were built to take the water from the Missouri River over to the Jim River. But when I went to Redfield in 1983, and by the way, Ray managed the same farm I managed, the one at Redfield, one time in its existence. We both had the same major professor in our PhDs. We have a lot of parallels. But when I went to Redfield in 1983, there was 1,900 acres of soybeans in Spink and Brown County combined. And I made the mistake on my PhD orals to say that I thought if we no-tilled, we could probably grow corn and soybeans in the Jim River Valley without irrigation. And Larry Fine, who, who Ray remembers, nobody else does, but he thought I didn't understand water very well. So he, he really made my life miserable for an hour or so in my orals. But he lived long enough to see no-till and different crop production move into the Jim River Valley, which now those two counties are the number one and number two corn producing counties in the state. And I was told before we came to Pier that we would never produce 
100 bushel dry land corn at, in Hughes County. I was told that, George. And I made a bet on it, so we won that bet several years in a row before the guy decided he didn't want to do that anymore. But it just it talks to the idea of we haven't, in the old days, we didn't use water well. The thing that we have done, no-till is just a tool. The thing we're doing is using water better. That's really what we're about. Uh, so in 1973, we had a whole bunch of guys got all excited about the Russian wheat deal. Energy prices were low in 1973. In, uh, interest rates were low in 1973. Everybody started putting in irrigators along the Missouri River because somebody had invented a center pivot. We didn't need to, we didn't need to have a level ground to irrigate anymore. So these guys started pumping water out of the Missouri River and irrigating, and it ran promptly back down the hill into the river. <laughs> because our soils were these wind-blown lust soils, and they, when they got tilled, which everybody said to grow irrigated corn, you got to have it black, and then we put water on it, it just looked like this floor. And that's kind of when I entered the scene to try to figure out how to stop runoff under irrigators. And that's where those efforts led to a meeting after a field day one night at Bob's Steakhouse where people said we really need to have more research effort along the center in the western part of the state. And <clears throat> another guy said, well, I'll get my brother-in-law who's in the legislature to get you some land. And I said, why don't you leave your brother-in-law alone? Let's see if we can't get our own land instead of having the state own it so we can control it. So that's the way this started. It's owned and directed by farmers, all fixed facilities and land and much of the irrigation equipment is owned by the corporation and things like that, right? Uh, again, the comparison of corn, soybean, spring wheat, winter wheat, and sunflower production in those three areas increased by 1.6 billion in 2014 as compared to 1986. We didn't do that because we set out to improve yields. The goal was to better manage our water, because that's what we were having trouble with. We weren't getting the water in the ground. Better manage our nutrients. And this is what this whole movement's about, whether you call it soil health or you call it no-till or you, whatever you call it. It's about better managing the ecosystem. We have to do a better job, or we're going to end up looking like the Europeans with their totally degraded soils. We've only been at this for 200 years. Uh, <clears throat> So what we did is starting to look at how the native systems work, because water goes in the ground in native systems. And you don't have the salty spots in native systems normally. And <clears throat> we call this a transformational change or a holistic report, uh, uh, approach. I stole this from Jay Fuhrer, who said he stole it from somebody else. But it's one of my favorite statements. The light bulb did not result by incrementally making candles better. <laughs> you know, when you think about that, it just kind of goes, oh, okay, yeah, that makes sense. You know, backing off, and, and so what we've been doing a lot of times in agriculture, we're just incrementally changing what is really a system that's been broken since it was in Europe. Instead of just saying, no, nah, this is stupid. Let's do something else. Farmer manages ecosystems, takes sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide, and makes them into products to be sold. And we look at this water cycle, energy flow, mineral cycle, community dynamics, and there's lots of places where we have talked about how we do that. Does the rain feed plants and recharge groundwater, or do you run off or deep percolate? If you're running your water off and you live at wall, you, that's a problem. You don't want to do that. Okay? <clears throat> then that's what's wrong here. We can now put on two inches of water in nine minutes with our irrigators, and we have nothing run off. And if you come in the summertime, and many of you have been there, we walk in behind those irrigators, and it totally changes your way of looking at things. And it's because we have this armor. We don't have the armor there because we think that's cute. It's there because it protects the soil, keeps the weeds from going, keeps the soil cool, does all these things. People say, well, I really like to use that big hole opener. Makes that wheat grow better. Well, now you have no more armor. Okay? You've got to have that armor. And that, that, that whole process starts it. 
There's where our earthworms live. They're protected. For anybody that's been around irrigation, this is 20 years of wheel track. If you've been around irrigation, those things always had big ruts in them. And when we first started doing this, we had our board of directors from Dakota Lakes, the guys that were irrigating, were irrigating with tillage, come to Redfield one day and we had a lateral move there running on some no-till ground. And we went out to look at crops and I'm walking along, I'm talking, blah, 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 blah. I turn around and I have no farmers behind me. They're all lined up on one of my wheel tracks going, why isn't that deeper? And I hadn't really ever thought about that. You know, they didn't set out to make shallow wheel tracks. And they noticed it because theirs weren't that way. <laughs> Take the E out of ET, evapotranspiration, ET. Evaporation makes you no money. When you make the water go through a plant, it makes you money. When you make it, let it just float off the surface, it doesn't make you any money. So one of the ideas behind this forage cover croppy thing is to try to take something that would have to evaporate to make it dry enough for you to plant or whatever and make it go through a, go through a plant. And yesterday at, at, <clears throat> in Nebraska, we had two young farmers that were on a panel and they're both talking about, well, you know, one of the things I really like now that I no-till and got cover crops and whatever, I can drive in that field anytime I want to. And <laughs> I don't sink in, I don't make ruts and all that kind of stuff. Doesn't happen year one, but they've noticed now that that is starting to happen. Make water enter the soil and then maximize the water holding capacity by building the organic matter. And we've talked about those things today. This is a good idea for irrigation. It's a great idea for those without irrigation like you guys. So most of our impact has actually been on the non-irrigation part of, of the country. Most of the guys that were irrigating in, in 1976 have quit because their lifts are too high. And they, they grow, <clears throat> they make more money per dollar invested by far on their dry land than they would on irrigation. Irrigation is expensive. And it costs you a lot of money every day. And, it, and it's, it, it's high management and it gets obsolete and it has issues. There's places where irrigation makes sense but you shouldn't be competing with, you know, until, you, until you've used every drop of water that Mother Nature gives you as efficiently as you can, you shouldn't even think about irrigation. Uh, ecosystems harvest sunlight and drive, that drive all other processes. Sunlight energy, that's stored in the residue. Removing these products from the ecosystem reduces the energy available, so if you're taking off all your residue, which they are in a lot of places, there's nothing to drive that soil biology. Everybody keeps talking about the soil biology. Well, the soil biology, you gotta feed them. And they eat residue. I had a guy from Iowa call me the other day and they, they're gonna harvest his corn and they're gonna take all his, a dairy, he got an agreement with the dairy. He's gonna harvest his corn and then they're gonna take, cut off and rake up and bale all his corn stalks. And he said, I want to continue to no-till my soybeans. How do I do that? <laughs> I'm going, we've got a lot more things to discuss than just how you're going to no-till your soybeans. Uh, <clears throat> that's one of the reasons we're doing the thing with livestock. It has to do with the residue and cycling the residue. So there's one of our cover crops, that mixture of barley, oats, and peas, and whatever. And we swath that. And you've seen these photos, there's winter wheat growing back in there, so we got the living root. It was in winter wheat uh, during the summer, but we also have winter wheat growing back there, uh, and it'll be there next spring, and then we'll kill it before we plant the corn in this case. And it, that thing stays nice and green in there. One of the things that, I don't know if Cody mentioned it, but the stuff we baled this year, those swaths we baled to make the comparison. So we have the residue removed move stuff. That, that swath was pretty wet when we baled it, but it was a wet fall. And, and so we've had to feed those bales because they were going bad, whereas the swath is fine. Did you find any really bad stuff in that swath the other day? No, day? Went in really wet because of the wet fall. Swathed it when it was pretty wet. <clears throat> it's fine. So there's, there's our, our mamas and their babies eating their swaths. But the question always comes up, does the swath get spread out? If you move that thing a little bit every day, they clean it right up, but you can see the armor still in there. 
that sloth reach stubble still and they leave that alone, it lays down and everybody's happy, okay? More cows, more goats, more sheep. Number one meat eaten in the world is goat. <laughs> okay, so, and they're good at getting rid of Canada thistle. So <laughs> we might want to get excited about this. But there's no way to feed the people in the world in the future if we're going to take meat away. The only way to take marginal land and turn it into human edible protein, produce human edible protein on it, upgrade the protein, is to use ruminant animals. And anybody that tries to tell you that we're going to have fake meat and all this stuff, they can't make feet, fake meat on marginal land. Okay? So if you're going to feed people, we're going to have to use animals, which is fine. That's what we should be doing anyway. 100% grass-fed ground beef. Certified. USDA. Where was this produced? Well, we get some cows from Montana that have never seen grain, doesn't know what grain looks like, some cull cows. You haul them to some place in central or eastern South Dakota and you put them on cover crops. And you fatten them on cover crops, you take them in Omaha and you make them in hamburger. Okay, so this is actually being done. Okay. I don't know why I'm having trouble with that. I'm probably doing something goofy. <clears throat> All tillage tools destroy soil structure. All tillage tools decrease water infiltration. All tillage tools reduce organic matter. And all tillage tools increase weeds. 27,000 gallons of water with 1% organic matter and 6 inches of soil. That's a fourth of an inch of water. If we can increase the organic matter by 4%, we put an extra inch in the top six inches and an extra two inches in the top foot. Grandpa had more organic matter than you do. He came here because it had high organic matter. He mined it. That's fine. Now you have to quit doing that. Uh, <clears throat> what about pests? Well, let's talk about aphids. Given the high rate of reproduction by aphids, shouldn't levels continue to increase all summer? Aphids are pregnant females that give birth to pay pregnant females. See, and all the guys in the, in the audience should be afraid. Because <laughs> you could be out of business if you're in the aphid world. If you're next reincarnation, you're born as an aphid, you're really in trouble. So pregnant females that give birth to pregnant females, you should grow high populations, but we don't because Aphid population dynamics depend on levels of natural enemies, temperature, and that kind of thing. Seven spotted lady beetle females ate on average 115 soybean aphids in 24 hours. The male eats 78. The instars, the little things that look like dragons, uh, ate 105. The other kind eats 95. Males 54, not quite as hungry, right? So when you go to check how many aphids you got in your weed or how many aphids you got in your soybeans, you also count the lady bugs. We had a wheat walk at the farm a few years ago and the entomologist was saying, oh well, he's way above thresholds. And I smiled and whatever, and we went home that night and Ruth says, you're not going to spray, are you? And I said, well, I'm going to go look at him Monday because I have lots of ladybirds in there. And the temperature was going to get hot. Monday or Tuesday, they're all gone, okay? So, no one knows the number one thing that kills aphids is fungi. 84% soybean aphids got whacked by this one fungi. So if we know the number one thing that kills aphids is fungi, number two are these predators, and somebody tells you, if we're going to come out and spray some herbicide, and I'm, why don't we just throw a little fungicide and a little insecticide in that and it just doesn't cost very much and it can't do any harm. See, you're going to kill all your predators. Seven species of aphid. <coughs> found, found seven species of aphid pathogenic fungi were found in them in 2003 and 4. Uh, overuse of fungicide can cause insect out, outbreaks. Uh, <coughs> If we use too many fungicides, you kill, you kill the, the predatory fungi. 
So we had this cover crop a few years ago. My neighbor come over and we were, you know, it was one pollinator type thing. It was a, a mustard and it was all flower and just full of bugs. He says, aren't you going to spray this? I said, why would I spray this? He said, well, there's bugs in here. Most bugs are good bugs. Some of these weren't good bugs, but I didn't want to harvest this crop anyway. I said, I'm feeding my predators. If I'm going to have predators around next year when the, when the bad bugs show up, I've got to feed them something to keep them around and let them have babies and stuff so they're ready, right? Over-reliance on herbicides leads to resistant weeds and maybe disease problems. Everybody talks about these resistant weeds. <clears throat> One of the problems we have is we have too many bacterial diseases now because we use surfactants too frequently. The things like bacteria, leaf spot, and whatever. What, what bacteria do is they penetrate into leaf. If you put a surfactant on and weaken the wax, you're going to get more disease. Fungicides, herbicides, and insecticides have collateral damage. They're disturbance to the system. Ray mentioned chloride. When we get a chloride, we always put a little chloride on with our wheat because chloride helps the wheat protect itself from disease. So we don't have to put the fungicide on. So we just put a little bit on there so it has high, high chloride concentration. High disturbance techniques, hoe drills and such, and, and vertical tillage increase weed pressure and cause soil erosion. And this, this is tillage erosion where you pull the top of the hills down. As I came north from Columbus yesterday up through Norfolk and into Yankton, uh, came home that way, they have all these big rolling lust hills down there. Blew up out of the Missouri River bottom. And they're still doing tillage on them and the tops of the hills are going down to the bottom. I couldn't believe they were still doing that, okay? The way we control pests is we use sanitation, rotation, and competition. Pesticides are only part of sanitation to keep weeds from going to seed, for instance. They're only part of rotation. What I want to do in terms of competition is to keep a weed small enough that my crop can compete with it. Fertilizer placement. Ray doesn't care about fertilizer placement. I do. Because <laughs> I don't want my weeds to have it. So I'm going to place my fertilizer either in a place or a time when it's not going to benefit the weed. Something like Palmer amaranth is a huge end feeder. And if you, if you broadcast nitrogen on, you're just feeding the weed. So we're going to place our fertilizer three inches from the corn row at the same depth, or the sorghum row. I don't care where its roots are, I just don't want the weeds to get to it. So I'm going to put it where the plant, my plant, my beneficial plant, can compete with the weeds. Uh, ecosystem that lake nutrients for extended periods of time become deserts. Saline seeps, and you have some of them out here, is because we aren't using and cycling the water and the nutrient uh, like it should be, and nutrient placement is part of cycling. I'm a farmer, I take sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide and make products that I can sell. And Ray said to me earlier today in a private conversation, what we need to do is be getting to the point where we're selling stuff instead of selling commodities, selling stuff that we're, we can sell on the internet. You guys all know how to do that. Us old guys don't know how to do that, but the young guys know how to do that. So we're gonna produce something and sell it. And there's people that wanna buy stuff that's produced sustainably or regeneratively or whatever. I had a half an hour conversation the other day on a telephone on the way down to Nebraska, I stopped on top of the hill, I had a half an hour conversation to the person in charge of sustainability for Cargill. Okay? And we've got to be able to give them a product that, they, that we can defend and say this is done the right way, the best environmental way, the best food safety way, and, and this is the way we do it. Focus on having the soil wet during the dry part of the year instead of just focusing on having it dry during the wet part of the year. So you can be the first guy to get done planting, right? And, you know, it, every year people come, and I got a neighbor that works the heck out of his ground, and sometimes his corn's bigger than mine the last weekend in June, the last Thursday in June. Most of the time it isn't, but sometimes it is, and guys will look at that and say, well, his corn's bigger than yours. And I used to go through a long explanation. Now I just say, oh, I didn't know you harvested corn in June. And I turn around and walk away and then kind of 
into, into that conversation. Focus on having the soil cool during the hot part of the year. Roots don't like it hot. And they don't do a good job of taking up nutrients if they're hot. That cover, that armor, it keeps the soil cool so we can have it cool during that hot part of the year. That's important to irrigation people. It's imperative to rain-fed farming. Mother Nature's an opportunist. If you have a problem, weed, disease, insect, I don't care, you provide the opportunity somewhere in your system. Here's resistant kochia that we developed on purpose in the early 1990s to prove we could. It's resistant to pursuit. Because I said, I predicted that was going to happen, the company threatened a lawsuit if I didn't retract, so I just developed my own. And then that negated that whole lawsuit thing. Uh, <clears throat> that's, that's kosher right there. That's chickpeas hiding in there, just for Mike Arnold. That's chickpea, Mike. <laughs> but we didn't have much at that period of time to control anything in chickpeas. We surely couldn't use it. Now, the cross-compliant, the cross-resistance came because those kosher I went and got from somebody that had been overusing glean. So it's not just a pursuit thing. It's all herbicides, that if we don't use them properly. Now, what happens there? Well, here, let's look at the, how this happens. If in the old days, you guys used to have a little bit of downy brome here. You don't have it anymore, right? It's gone. Scott, you don't have any cheatgrass anymore, do you? He's just grinning. Uh, <clears throat> but that used to be a huge problem because it did a rotation that provided huge opportunities. And Randy Anderson made this statement, two years of warm season crops or a fallow, one year of warm season crop and a fallow, uh, reduced the number of seeds by 95%. So if we did wheat, corn, fallow, the old eco-fallow thing, we could take care of cheatgrass. Same thing happens with warm season weeds like the Palmer amaranth or water hemp or something like that. And the reason that works is let's take foxtail. It emerges, Palmer amaranth, same time, after the corn's planted and goes to flower before the corn is harvested. So it has its whole life cycle here. And it can compete in the early phases. If I put winter wheat in, that thing hasn't emerged. Winter wheat, wheat has full canopy and it, it's harvested before that thing goes to flower and you can control it. Just very simple thing. We had long-term rotation study. Maybe some of you remember that. We had warm and cool season crops. Everything was done no-till. It was in Lyman County on some promise soils. We did that for 12 years. And in the 13th year, Randy Anderson came out. We had a, what we had to do was, was uh, plant it all uniformly to a wheat crop, which we did. And he came out and he counted the number of weeds in the different rotations. Where we did wheat chickpea for 12 years, he found 94 weeds. Where we did wheat, corn, chickpea, he found 40. Where we did a more diverse rotation than that, he found seven. Claire Simus, who a lot of you still remember, had a similar type study uh, where he used an anhydrous knifer once every four years. Other than that, he was no-tilling. And he had a, a, low di he had a, a high diversity sunflower, wheat, corn, spring wheat, and he had a low diversity wheat uh, millet rotation and, and Randy did the same thing with his. And what we found was the same trend, highest with the low diversity, lowest with the high diversity rotation, but since I didn't do any disturbance, I did better. The real comparison there is tillage and poor rotation, 20, 225 weeds per square yard or square meter, no till and good rotation, seven weeds, 97% weed control just with cultural practices. That has to do with disturbance. So if you're thinking, well, Dad's just going to go out and disc a little bit, right? I mean, one of the, one of the things I used to tell guys, because they, they'd want to start no-tilling, but Dad didn't want or the uncle didn't want to get rid of the machinery, just in case. We might need it. I said, fine, okay, just tell them you'll do that. But, you know, to protect the tires and the hydraulic cylinders, take the tires off and the hydraulic cylinders off before you park it over in the edge. And then they really won't be tempted to start up and go out and screw with it when you go on vacation, right? So, because <clears throat> that used to happen at times. Kid goes on vacation, dad goes disc a bunch of ground just, just to make it better. Uh, he took green foxtail placed at three depths in the soil, zero, two, and four inches, and he looked at the number of live seeds yearly, okay? <clears throat> 
After two years, if he left it on the surface, only 11% were still alive. Buried two inches, 28%. Buried four inches, 55%. If you're doing disturbance, you're constantly digging up and burying and making seeds go dormant. You can't control the weed seed bank. So to prove that even further, we took four places at Dakota Lakes. I let little areas go to all the weeds grow and go to seed once. And then he tilled a small area and left a small area not, not tilled. And then when we put herbicide on these areas, we put a tarp over top of them. So they never got herbicides on them. And he cowed on the seedlings yearly for three years. Okay? First year, not much difference between tilled and no-tilled. Second year, not much difference. It's when you have that two-year break that you get the big difference. Corn, pea, winter wheat, corn. If you've got a weed that goes to seed in the corn that you really can't control in corn, you can get rid of 96% of it. If you're just doing every other year, you can't. So there's a typical thing. If we drive a little wide with our winter wheat, we don't really get a runaway in terms of weeds. So real quickly, rotation types, simple rotation. This is the one most people think about. Wheat, corn, canola, spring wheat, winter wheat, corn, sunflower, corn, soybean, wheat, fallow, whatever. They're simple. They're predictable. Limited number of crops to manage the market. This is what a lot of people are doing, but they're very predictable to the insects and such. Rotations with perennial sequences, which I think we're going to have to use. We're going to have to put those deep roots in that Cody was talking about. And we can, if we, we can do a stupid rotation for about six years and then put in a perennial for three or four, or <clears throat> the only thing I don't like about this is I'd rather see grasses in there. Uh, but there's lots of examples of those. Limited number of annual crops to manage the market. Excellent place to spread manure if you're going to spread manure. You can probably produce more soil structure with annual, than annual crops because of the grass, especially with grass mixtures. Uh, disadvantage, you've got a, Cody pointed that out today. He said, we got that new rotation we started. Uh, we're only putting in a, a perennial five years out of 20. I'm not sure that's enough, okay? Uh, compound rotations where we take two rotations and make them into simple rotations, make them more complex. We were talking about one of these at noon. Spring wheat, winter wheat, corn, soybean, corn, soybean. Half the corn is behind soybeans and half the corn is behind wheat. If you're over in the Jim River Valley, that's probably a good, good rotation for you because you can grow pretty good corn behind soybeans. As you get further west, you can't do that. You got to have more moisture. I call this the mother-in-law or banker rotation because the mother-in-law or banker comes to visit you in June, you show them this corn planted in the soybean. It looks great. <laughs> if, if they come in August or September, most likely you'll take them out and show them the stuff that was in the, in the wheat stubble. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> still have limited number of crops to manage. Uh, creates more than one sequence for some crop types. If you grow corn behind beans every year, you're going to get corn rootworm beetle at five from the cornfield to soybean fields to lay their eggs. That's happened in eastern uh, Corn Belt. If we grow, if everybody here grew corn behind wheat, we would get corn rootworm that fly to the wheat stubble to lay their eggs. So we got to try to be not predictable. Complex rotations where crops the same crop type vary, so we start putting in bill, uh, barley instead of two wheats. We got barley or oats. Uh, we got both sunflower and pea, that kind of thing. Has some advantages. Very capable of creating a wide array of crop type by sequence combinations. Uh, sorghum and corn have advantages and disadvantages, but they complement each other. It takes a lot more crop management skills. But this is why we pay you guys the big bucks. Right? It's not you got to have the management skills. It's not because you can drive a tractor straight anymore because I got auto steer. So now while the tractor's going across the field, you can work on your management. Uh, stacked rotations is the one that surprised us and that we developed and we didn't really realize the power until later. It's where we put the same crop or crop type twice in a row. And the idea is to do that to get the long break. 
the secret here is the long break, to let that weed population go down, right? And so <clears throat> once it's down, it takes a couple of years for it to come back up again. So we do two and then get out of there and we got a four year break before we come back to that crop again. Okay, <clears throat> we keep the pest population diverse or confused. Uh, diversity in sequence and intervals. It's a mix of long and short residual herbicide programs. For you guys out here, if you're afraid of atrazine because of low rainfall, if you stack two warm season grasses, corn or sorghum or millet, one after the other, you can use a high rate of atrazine in the first one. That's one of the most powerful things you can do. It's cheap. Atrazine's cheap. And you can do that kind of stuff. And especially if you're doing grazing things, okay? Two-year break between corn and wheat, so you don't have to worry about the head scab thing. Uh, but the goal is to allow sufficient time for press pressure to decline to very low levels before sequencing the crop or crop type two times. Uh, we can reduce the risk of developing biotype resistance and we reduce the cost of herbicide programs. Uh, some crop sequences may not be ideal. We really don't stack broadleaves very often. But the goal is to be in, inconsistent in both sequence and interval. So look at your rotation, say how predictable am I? Right? To you it might look predictable to insects, I mean if you're just doing something that allows them to develop um, some habit. In the, in, the cor in the western corn belt, for instance, corn soybean guys now have uh, corn rootworm beetles where the eggs don't hatch for two years instead of hatching the first year. Because it's always one year. So they figured that one out. And that's why they've got to use BT and all that stuff where we don't have to. Here's some rotations utilizing both stacked and, and, and normal sequences. Uh, <clears throat> canola, winter wheat, corn, the two corns, and then the rest of it's not stacked. We got one we use on the farm uh, on the north unit where we do two wheats, a pea, and then we do sorghum corn actually up there. And then, and then pea, I guess that's one here, right here. Winter wheat, winter wheat, sunflower, sorghum, corn, pea. And this one really is a, uh, some kind of, a, of an oil seed. Might be flax, whatever. Uh, dry land rotations, uh, again, those, that's where those at. You'll be able to get these slides too. But there's no set recipe or best, best rotation. The, everybody needs to pick their own. It's gonna vary with fields, it's gonna vary with if your neighbor has resistant kosher and he lets it blow across you, <laughs> it's, it's going to vary with a lot of things, and including, you know, your personal lifestyle. When, when do you want to have a little vacation time in the summer or, or whatever? Show you a, a few slides. Uh, there's a, a rotation in 2006. That wheat look, didn't look very good. 2006, very dry year. And right across the road, that's what the winter wheat looked like. What was the difference there? And you can see it from an aerial photo. Uh, <clears throat> the good looking wheat was in this corn pea winter wheat and been in that rotation since 1990. This was 2006. And this one was soybean corn pea winter wheat. Half broad leaves, half low residue. We didn't have the armor. And look at that wheat, okay? What's it mean in yields? 2006, 60 versus 29 bushel, 7.9 inches of rain from the time we harvested the peas until we harvested the wheat. In 2005, when we got 23 inches, 92 versus 57. In 2002, which is the first time this happened, 6.4 inches in a year, 56 versus 28. I can't afford to do, I hear this all the time, I can't afford to grow this, I can't afford to do this, I've got to do the high value things, I've got to do the low residue things because they make me more money. They don't make you more money if you look at this type of response. This rotation just doesn't have enough <clears throat> high residue. So we've taken the soybeans out. Cody mentioned this, and now we put, we have these, this three-way, just looks like this three-way, same thing, other than we have a five-year perennial sequence in there. And in 17 or 18 years, we're going to have good information. And when I explained that to Cody one day, he said, you better keep riding your bicycle if you're going to be around here <laughs> to watch that. What happens where there's lots of water? 
you know, surely they don't need to worry about this, right? So, <clears throat> uh, corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean. Uh, <clears throat> first year soybeans, 76 bushels. Second year soybeans, 81. This is under irrigation. Uh, if I just do corn, soybeans, I get 62.9 bushel. So if I average those two from the other one, 78.8 versus 62.9. So the guy doing corn soybeans is getting less soybean yields. How about corn yields? Well, continuous corn, we've had corn in one field since 1990. It's about 203 bushel the acre, average type thing. Corn soybeans, 217. Corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean, the two corns average. The first one's like 250 or so. The second one's 217 or 220, uh, 235. Okay, so what if I grew 5,000 acres of that? I got a million bushels, if I got 5,000 acres of corn, I got a million bushels of corn. And a big ass dryer, lots of trucks. <laughs> I mean, wow. But there's guys that do that and think they make money, okay? Uh, <clears throat> corn, soybean, I got 2,500 acres of corn, I got 2,500 acres of soybean. Corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean, I got 2,000 acres of corn, 2,000 acres of soybeans, and 1,000 acres of wheat. And there's the bushels. Okay? Would you trade 7,200 bushels of corn for 120,000 bushels of wheat today? <laughs> See, that's what the numbers show you. And I can't afford to do anything but corn, soybean. I produce more bushels of soybeans on 2,000 acres of soybeans in this rotation than you do on 2,500 acres of soybeans in that rotation. Interesting. Can't afford to do that with small grain over here. Can't afford not to. First time I went to Argentina, they were doing seven years of pastures and seven years of cropping, and then they're Cropping was no-till with cover crops and diversity. Corn, wheat, <clears throat> beans. And I had a friend of mine, we dug out a little bit of soil and he held it up. And if you want to talk about what is a healthy soil, that's a healthy soil. And then they outlawed the export of beef. Get rid of the beef thing. Can't export beef. Keep all the beef for the poor people. Well, the guys, the poor people can't eat enough beef. <laughs> they can't pay enough for it. So the guys started, got rid of the beef and started growing soybeans on soybeans. I went back in 2006 and it looked like this. Exactly the same field. And went back a year ago this last fall. They haven't changed that yet. And now they have lakes showing up where they never had lakes. They have rivers showing up where there were never rivers because they've got the water cycle broken so badly. We can't expect our governments and our companies and whatever to understand the importance of maintaining our soil resource. We have to do this ourselves. Organic matter makes a difference. There's our daughters who are much older than that now. Uh, one of them might come bopping in here pretty soon. Uh, but this is a prairie plant, and, and, and Cody showed you one of those. Right? Compare that to what you get with wheat and whatever. And that cycles these nutrients back to the surface. If your pHs are dropping, you've li you got lime down here, but you keep pushing it down, it goes sideways, it becomes a saline seep. Bring it back up, get it on the surface. But if you haul that off and take it to a feedlot, Cody showed you that too today, that nutrient doesn't get back to the fields. All tillage tools destroy soil structure. All tillage tools decrease water infiltration, right? People, oh, I got this vertical tillage thing. I got this tillage thing. I got that thing. It works great. No, it doesn't. Mother Nature doesn't do tillage. Tillage is to agriculture what fracturing is to petroleum. They both increase the speed and extent of nutrient removal from the resource, leaving the resource degraded. That's not what we're about. We're not miners. I did ask the North Dakota and the Alberta people when I was there earlier this year, what's the hurry? Why don't you leave some of that, some of that oil there for your grandkids? I mean, do you not like your descendants? Why are you mad at them? Why do you got to get rid of it all right away? 
I mean, you don't think we're going to use some of that down the road 100 or 200 years? Okay. Some experts propose using tillage as a means to address weed resistance. If tillage was so good at getting rid of weeds, they should all be gone by now. And I can go through the science of that, but I'm not going to. Okay? Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure.